In, in the Old Testament, one of the things that the Lord told Israel was that they should teach their children the ways of the Lord. There was a reason for that. You know, Israel had to be preserved for many hundreds of years. It's about 1500 years after the nation of Israel came into the land of Canaan that Jesus was born and the nation had to continue and not fall away into idolatry and become like all the other nations. And then they would not be ready for the coming of the Savior. So you see what an important responsibility every father in Israel had had. I don't know if Christians take their responsibility just as seriously. So I want to show you a few verses from the Psalms. Psalm 78. I want to read from verse 5. Psalm 78 and verse 5. The Lord established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, and he commanded our fathers, Psalm 78, verse 5, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, so that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers. So they were to teach their children with a twofold goal in view. And that's the goal we have also, if God has given us children, it's a tremendous responsibility that God has given us children. One is that they should put their confidence in God, verse 7. We have to train our children to put their confidence in God and not forget his works. His works in time past is what enable us to have confidence in him. And that's why we need to teach our children the works of God. First of all, in scripture, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, that's why it's very important and the responsibility is primarily put upon fathers. It says here that the fathers, verse 5, should teach their children. In the New Testament also, the emphasis is on the fathers. And it's only if a father is a good-for-nothing, useless, lazy father, then the mother has to take over and do the job of the father. That's like a dead father. You know, if a father dies, then the mother's got to go to work to support the children. And if a father is spiritually dead and good-for-nothing, then the mother has to take that spiritual responsibility. But it's primarily the responsibility of the fathers to teach their children to put their confidence in God. And it says here, so that they don't forget the works of God. So the basis for our faith is, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So if we teach people, teach our children the scriptures, and what God did for people at different times, you know, the wonderful Old Testament stories of faith and the New Testament stories of Jesus and the apostles. And in addition to that, the things that God has done in your life from the time you were born again. I have been encouraging people, parents, to write down in a notebook or if you have a computer, to open a folder in a computer where you write little, little incidents of miracles God has done in your life. So that when your children are 20 years old, you can give them a little book to encourage their faith, to remind them of the works of God, which are not only written in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but which were written in your life from the time you were born again. So often God has done so many things for us and we forget to tell our children those things and we forget them. I mean, if I myself, I wish somebody had told me this when I first got married, I could have written a, quite a number of things. I'm not saying we should produce a 500-page book and give it to our children. They won't read it. 
So we don't have to write every little detail, every verse God spoke to us from, but, but significant miracles God did for us. I mean, if it's just one page a month or one page in three months, something that God spoke or did for us, you know, you make a little journal. It's a tremendous legacy and inheritance you can give to your children. Look how parents are so careful to give money to their children. They save up, save up. They don't just save up at the last minute. They save up throughout their years. Why not save up some a record of instances that we write down so that they don't forget the works of God? Why? So that our children can have their confidence in God. And we are going into a time <clears throat> as we approach the end where people are going to despise God and turn away from Christ and make fun of the things of the Lord and of Scripture. And we need to raise up a generation who will stand for the Lord. So faith is the first thing we have to put into our children's hearts. By instructing them in their mind, we lead them to faith in their heart. I want to show you what Paul said to Timothy concerning his mother. Obviously, his father did not do the job because his father was, as far as I know, unconverted. He was a Greek businessman who was probably interested in making money, not in bringing up his child in godly ways. But the mother was a God-fearing Christian. And that's an encouragement for those of you who have irresponsible husbands. Second Timothy chapter 1, he says in verse 5, to Timothy, I am mindful of the sincere faith which is inside your heart. And that faith was first in the heart of your grandmother, Lois. And then it came down from the heart of your grandmother to the heart of your mother, Unike. And I'm sure that faith is now in you. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That the faith that God has given you in your heart, you transmit to your child, goes into his or her heart, and they transmit it to their child, children, so it goes into their heart. So you have served two generations thereby, and if they keep doing that, they'll be a witness for Christ right until the time he comes. See, that's why Israel had to be preserved. And right through, God had a remnant in Israel that was faithful to him, even though there were hundreds and thousands of Pharisees and hypocrites, there was a remnant. And those 11 apostles were part of that remnant. And so also as we approach the end, a lot of Christendom is going to turn away into hypocrisy, prosperity gospel, and all types of deception. But there will be a remnant that will be true to God right up until the end. And we have to be responsible, especially as we grow older, and I say, you've got to start young. You can't wait till your children are 10 or 12 years old. You've got to start when they're one, to instill faith in their heart, to pray for them. Pray for them. In fact, you should start praying for your child as soon as it's in the mother's womb. The first thing is that they put their confidence in God. And second, in Psalm 78, verse 7, is to keep his commandments. So here with this God-fearing grandmother that Timothy had who taught her daughter to uh, trust in the Lord and to keep his commandments. And for some reason, that girl, Unike, went astray. And that's why she married a Greek, an unconverted Greek businessman. That can happen sometimes. And... Um, but she came back and she repented. And we know that because she brought up Timothy with the same faith. I don't know what happened. Something may have happened that made her drift away. We had to be so careful with our daughters that they don't just go and fall for some rich businessman who's unconverted. But I'm sure that mother prayed for her even when she went astray. And if you have children who've gone astray, you can pray for them. That mother's faith and prayer brought her daughter back. And she came to the Lord and she must have said, Lord, I'm sorry that I disobeyed you and I married outside your will. 
but I got a son now. I'm going to make up for that. I'm going to pour my heart into him. And she spent time with him. And by the time Timothy was 18 or 19 years old, the Apostle Paul selected him. I mean, if the Apostle Paul selected your son to be in his team, brother, sister, that's no greater honor you can get on this earth. That's greater than being the president of any country. The Apostle Paul selected him. What a work that mother did. That Paul could discern, here's a godly young man. And he later discovered it was the job of his mother and grandmother. So parents have a tremendous influence on children. Why do you think Judas Iscariot kept stealing money? Is it possible that his parents ignored little, little wrong things that little Judas Iscariot did when he was a small boy? Oh, little boy, darling, don't do that. That's not the way to talk to a child who's, who's disobedient, dishonors parents and steals little things or tells lies. That person will one day grow up to betray Jesus Christ. We have both types of examples in scripture. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Timothy did not depart from it. And Judas Iscariot did not depart from the way he was brought up. So there we have warnings to teach our children faith, confidence in God, and to keep his commandments. God gave one command to Adam and Eve and they disobeyed it. God gave one command for children. He hasn't given 10 commandments for children. He gave one command, honor your father and mother. That's the only thing we got to teach our children when they begin. And as they grow up, of course, you got to teach them not to tell lies. But if they don't begin with being taught to honor their father and mother, I can prophesy that they will go astray. That means they should never speak rudely to parents. They shouldn't show their hand to parents like this. Teach them to obey God's commandments and teach them to obey the first time you speak to them. Children are not like that. Sometimes you have to speak to them 10 times to obey. That's not a, a sign of a good upbringing. In the beginning, they are like that, but we have to be strict with them. What a joy it is to see in a home, a father or mother telling a child, do that or don't do that. And the child immediately obeying whether it's five years old or 15 years old. It's such a joy to see that, but it's so rare to see it in our day because we, have, we think we are patient with our children. When we tell them, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, then we get upset and spank them or something. We can save ourselves a lot of that if we train them gently, graciously, Son, my girl, you have to obey daddy and mommy the first time we say something, unless you didn't hear it or you didn't understand it. Because the Bible says there's only one thing you have to do when you're a child. Honor your father and mother. Children, obey your parents. Why do we have a generation growing up that's so careless about obeying God's commandments? Because when they were small, they were careless about obeying their parents. So it's a very big responsibility. Psalm 90 is another psalm <clears throat> written by Moses who had seen all the problems in the wilderness with the children of Israel disobeying God, turning away from the borders of, at the borders of Canaan. So he says in his prayer, this is the only psalm written by Moses, Psalm 90, he says in verse 12, Teach us, Lord, to number our days that at the end of our life we can present to you a heart of wisdom. Jesus grew in wisdom. That's the example we have to give to our children. Jesus grew in wisdom because he obeyed Joseph and Mary from the time he was a child. So teach us to present to you a heart of wisdom. We want our children to have a heart of wisdom. And that will come as they learn to obey. And so he goes on to say in verse 16, 
let your the last part let your majesty appear to your children let your work appear to your servants and let your majesty appear to your children and how is that going to be by the beauty or the loveliness of the lord being upon us first in the King James Version, it's translated as, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Connect those two verses. O oh God, let your glory be seen by our children, by your beauty being seen in our lives. What did Timothy see in his mother? Not just instruction. He saw her in times of trouble and trial, trusting God, and in not getting upset and in a panic when things went wrong. That's how we got faith, not just being taught, but having faith because he saw what, how she reacted in different times. You know, children observe a lot. And how we react in times of trial, and difficulty, O oh Lord, let your beauty be upon me so that your glory will be seen by my children. What a wonderful prayer to pray. And finally, Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Children are the gift of the Lord. Verse 3. Why does he give us this gift? They are to be like arrows in the hand of a warrior. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. In those days, the enemies were human, and just like worldly people would think, oh, if I have a lot of children, they can stand with me when all my enemies come to shout at me and yell at me in my house. But today our enemies are spiritual. We don't have human enemies because our kingdom is not of this world. But we have enemies in the spiritual realm. And we want to train up our children to be warriors who learn from early in life to resist Satan and to say no to the devil and that they can grow up to be together with you warriors for the kingdom of God. So that is our desire for all of our children. We're going to pray for two children now. <clears throat> the first is my own granddaughter, my 10th great-grandchild. Did I get it wrong? No. No, I didn't. I have 10 grandchildren that are great. That's what I mean by great-grandchildren. <laughs> I have four great sons, and they got married, and I've got four great daughters, and I have ten great grandchildren. So I'm thankful for each one of them. I believe the parents have a big responsibility to bring them up in the way that we tried to, Annie and I tried to bring up our own children. It's a huge responsibility, as I said, and I want to say to all of you who prayed for your children, and they've grown up, and they got married, you need to pray for your grandchildren now. Because it's not enough that we have prayed for our children. If you're still alive and your grandchildren are born, we must pray for them. That's what I seek to do. So that in their generation, they can live for God and be witnesses for him. So I want to encourage all of you to do that. Pray for them. There's the greatest thing we can do. That in every generation, there'll be a witness for Christ. This is so important. Okay, please come.